So good morning to everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar on measuring the environmental impacts of tourism at the European Union level. This webinar is organized by the Europe Park Federation on behalf of the European Commission. For those who do not know Europe Park yet, I would like just to say a few words about who we are. The Europe Park Federation is the oldest. Uh, we celebrated uh, already 50 years last year and largest association of protected areas in Europe. We count currently with more than 400 members, mainly protected areas, but not only, issued from across 40 countries. We have always worked to support protected areas to preserve natural beauty in Europe. We know that nature has no boundaries and that this can be achieved better by working together. This is why we promote networking and collaboration with different sectors. We have developed uh, several lines of work and programs. One of the best known and successful programs is the European Chapter for Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas. This is a management tool and a work system that helps protected areas to work in partnership with the territory and all stakeholders, including tourist business and travel operators in organizing uh, tourism in a sustainable and responsible way in the protected area and, and, and the surroundings. We have currently 92 uh, parts that have been awarded um, with the, this award from across uh, 15 countries. My name is Teresa Pastor and I'm the manager of this sustainable, sustainable tourism uh, program in protected areas at the European level. So since last uh, June, uh, Europark, uh, we had the honor of taking part of the Together for EU Tourism Expert Group so specifically, we participate in the Green Transition Subgroup, which is uh, coordinated by Ramune Gazi Bigelit Venturi. Ramune is a policy officer for tourism uh, at, at the DG Grow, and now she will kindly address us a few words uh, to formally open uh, this webinar. So please, Ramune, the floor is yours. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Uh, a warm welcome to all uh, on behalf of the tourism team uh, from the Commission. Um, just to say that there is probably a reason why we are starting uh, discussions uh, in, with, the, with the stakeholders, with the, with the help of the expert group on the measuring of environmental impact of tourism. Uh, it has been chosen uh, by this expert group to start the series of topics actually this year. Um, other two groups uh, that are focusing on the angle of digital and social uh, will continue their work in the coming weeks. Um, so when we discuss uh, sustainable tourism, measurement, uh, data, labels, uh, sustainability schemes and the destinations, it always appears as the most pressing um, uh, issue that needs solutions. It is also very challenging, we see that. So again, I think this is a, a good topic to start with. Uh, my colleague Christophe uh, will explain later on when the commission is working on uh, from the statistics perspective, um, just to mention that probably you all know by now, uh, there is an EU Ecolabel for accommodations and EMA scheme uh, for organizations that we are promoting at the level of the EU. A few months ago, uh, we have launched a project uh, that will develop a study to apply product environmental footprint uh, for accommodations. And I'm sure you have all heard about the Green Claims Initiative uh, that will ensure uh, trusted and certified labels are used. We do hope that this, uh, this webinar will bring us a step closer towards better understanding where we stand and what are the current challenges in measuring environmental footprint. Uh, we do hope for some working uh, recommendations eventually, hopefully also with a set of uh, simple workable indicators at the EU level. So again, this is just the beginning of the work. Um, from now on, the work of this expert group will be supported by the stakeholder platform. And uh, just in case uh, some of you are not aware uh, what it is, uh, just to let you know that uh, we have launched already in the testing phase, a uh, stakeholder support platform, which will be, uh, the next slide please, very briefly, which will serve basically as a one-stop shop for the stakeholders by gathering news and articles, uh, policy and uh, legislation section. There will be also a section for funding and business uh, support opportunities, 
the pledges that we are gathering and updating, uh, best practices and solutions, the calendar, um, also very important, the community discussion and collaboration space. So we do hope uh, that this will be a very useful tool for all of you. And I don't want to take any more time. I'm really uh, looking forward to the discussions and welcome to all once again. Thank you very much. Back to you, Teresa. Uh, so yes, with no further ado, I would like to start the webinar. Uh, the aim is to have a quick overview of what the main challenges are when it comes to measuring uh, the environmental impacts of students uh, at the, in the EU. This is a very complex uh, topic, as uh, Ramon has said, we just, uh, with this webinar will be just the beginning of, of uh, our task of um, collecting information and, and proposing some recommendations to the DG Grow. We will hear in this webinar from different perspectives and uh, our aim is that we reflect uh, all together. So to please uh, use the, the chat uh, to post questions and to put your comments. We won't have time, of course, to deal with them uh, during uh, this webinar, but they will uh, help us to nurture this uh, document that we will uh, work in, in in the months uh, ahead of us. As you know, this uh, webinar is being recorded and the presentations and the recording itself will be available on the Europark um, website and, and probably also uh, under the platform that uh, Ramun has just presented to us. So uh, we have a heavy program. This webinar is very long, it's two hours. We will have a, a five minutes uh, break. Uh, in the first part, we're going to hear Professor Graham Miller, uh, after him, uh, Giovanni Pinocchiaro, and then Ioannis Papas. We will have some time for discussion. We will do a five minutes break and we continue with uh, Christoph Demunter and Ian Corbett. And again, we will have some time for, for discussion and the conclusions uh, will be um, made up uh, by Ralph Pastnightner, who is the chairman of the T42 Green Subgroup. So this webinar is going to be facilitated by myself, but also by Lisa Kokarinen, who is the Head of Sustainable Development at Visit Finland. So uh, I now pass the floor to Professor Graham Miller. Please, Graham, if you can share your screen. Thanks, Thank you very much. Let me share the screen. So uh, my name is uh, Graham Miller. I'm a professor of sustainable business uh, here at Nova School of Business and Economics in Lisbon. Um, I started thinking about how do we measure the sustainability of tourism in 1996, which is a very long time ago. Um, and when I started talking to organizations about how do we measure sustainability in tourism, almost nobody would talk to me at that time because it wasn't something that they were interested in. Um, in 2013, the European Commission asked me to develop the European Tourism Indicator System. And so I was the lead researcher on the ETIS system. And as many of you will know, that system came to an end as well when the, um, when the commission changed uh, and shifted priorities. Uh, so it's very pleasing that here we are 2024, um, indicators are back on the agenda again and we need to think about indicators. I heard uh, Johan Wokström from the Swedish School of Economics talking recently, and he said that ideas take a generation to go from initial idea to being something that's accepted commonly and beginning to act. So if I started in 1996, that's nearly 30 years ago. Uh, so that feels like a generation. So maybe this is an idea that time is coming again. It would be really nice before I retire if, um, if, it, if uh, indicators can be something that's embedded in the way we work. Maybe next slide. My... Um, I'm going to talk about the benefits and the fallacies of, of indicators. These, in, these benefits are pretty obvious, I would imagine, to most people. It's why I started looking at this topic. I was very much of the belief that what gets measured gets managed, uh, and I'll return to that idea. I believed in rational decision-making. My economics 
training tells me that people make rational decisions. Everybody in business says that we make data-driven, empirical, empirically driven decisions. Um, I am a child of Mrs. Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, the market economy that says that the consumer is king. And therefore my view was if we can measure sustainability, we can tell people is this product and it's unsustainable and this product and it's sustainable, rational consumer will choose the sustainable product, business will produce the sustainable product and so we will have a more sustainable world. And it's these kind of benefits that we've taken as true. Uh, and we've, we've, this is the why we measure. Uh, and I'll return to why as an important question as well. But indicators allow us to measure progress, they inform decision-making, they identify where we've got strengths, where we've got weaknesses, where we need to improve. They help us communicate with our audience because we communicate in data. Uh, and this is an important part of the narrative. It allows organizations to be accountable with the public institutions or private institutions. Once we've got data, once we can establish where we are, then we can set benchmarks, we can have targets that enable certification and reporting systems. Then we can engage stakeholders and appealingly, we can think beyond just economic data uh, and we can begin to measure things that are not just economic uh, scale, um, which is which is a good thing. So these things should be um, should be non-contentious. The next slide. So I developed the um, European Tourism Indicator Scheme uh, with Louise Twining Ward, who's now at the World Bank, um, and that system uh, no longer exists. Um, it was not supported um, beyond uh, uh, beyond a few years after the end of the project by uh, the European Commission, uh, and so ultimately it died. Um, these were some of the concerns um, that um, that were expressed by all of the stakeholders we spoke to, all of the different destinations that we um, that we worked with. Um, these are not in any order, uh, other than perhaps the uh, still some of the scars on my back or the, the noise that I heard these with. But um, there were concerns about the cost, how much uh, cost this took uh, to develop. Um, and the associated with the cost was the fact that the, the destinations, the DMOs, didn't have the skills to be able to go and collect the data. Um, they weren't connected with the other sectors that they need to a sufficient degree to be able to collect the required data. So they needed to collect data from the water companies, from the energy companies, from the transport sector, from the parks sector, from the forestry commission, from the fire service, and they weren't connected with those. They didn't understand the data. And so it was costly, it was time consuming. Um, and that made people feel uncomfortable. And there was this broad sort of discomfort also with the idea that because they couldn't collect data on all of the indicators, and therefore this wasn't a system that was worth pursuing. And I tried, every time this objection was, was raised to say, you have to think of this as a journey, just start measuring what you can measuring and then work out how to measure the other things as you go. But don't do nothing because you can't do everything. But a lot of the destinations seem to feel really uncomfortable with the idea that here was a list of 20 indicators and we can't do five of them and therefore, this is not a project we can complete, and so I won't, I won't undertake it. There was very much a preference for what was seen as objective data, quantitative data, rather than subjective or qualitative data, um, and subjective seen as inferior, and at best destinations would use subjective data 
until they could work out a way to quantify it and get what they saw as absolute objective data. And I think that was a mistake, but that was an objection, or that was a, a concern that was raised. Um, reference for indicators that were specific to their destination, as opposed to common to a range of destinations and therefore allowing comparability. So destinations very much wanted what was specific to them rather than common to everybody. And that weakens the set of data if um, we can't compare across destinations. That was the original intention of ETIS. These systems tended, tended to be reliant on a single champion. Um, and if that champion then moved uh, or ran out of energy, then the, the enthusiasm for this died. And you know, if you scale that up, that's really what happened at a European Commission level. The champion for this uh, was no longer in a position to champion. Uh, and so the support disappeared. So there was that lack of political support. And I think really important, there was a lack of media support for this. So the media weren't asking for these data and therefore there wasn't the political pressure to continue funding this scheme. The ETIS scheme does assume this linear data-driven decision-making and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, and also destinations wanted targets. They wanted to be able to say, okay, once we've measured it, what does good look like? Uh, what should we be uh, aiming for? Uh, so next slide, please. So this is a paper that I published with, uh, with Gloria Cravolo, who's now at the University of Exeter. Uh, my former colleague, Xavier Font at the University of Surrey and I, where we looked at the extent to which these indicator schemes, the, the uh, ETIS scheme had been effective and what we found was we found it very difficult to find evidence of this. Here's the problem. Here's the data. Here's a solution. Instead, what we found was collecting data adds to the general context of decision making. And that general context then becomes a more informed and a more sustainably literate level of understanding that affects all of the decisions that we make. So it's it's hard to pinpoint, okay, here was a problem, we collected data and we made a more informed decision. It's much more that the data and that all of the indicators led to an overall improved context for decision making. So it goes against this idea that decision making is linear and specifically empirically driven and goes to a context of, of awareness and literacy. So next slide, and this is my last slide. These are what I think are the, the fallacies of indicators. This is what nearly 30 years of working on indicators has taught me. Um, we focus on the what and the how and not the why. Uh, we assume that all those reasons for indicators are why we measure, and therefore what we focus on is this technical completeness, and we focus on how we're going to measure it, and we focus on what we're going to measure. Um, and we forget um, some of this popular appeal, some of this political appeal. So I think we focus on technical completeness. And if we want to develop a momentum, we want to develop indicators that are popular, that people want the data, we have to think much more about what are the data that people want? What will get, get, capture their attention and make them more informed overall rather than specific pieces of data? We focus on what's easy to collect versus the data worth having. Uh, it's why we continue to measure GDP. GDP, everybody knows, is a terrible indicator of our well-being. It's not only it's a terrible indicator, uh, and it has been for 70 years, we celebrate it moving in the wrong direction. When GDP goes up, we celebrate. Politicians tell us how they will measure, how they will increase GDP. GDP is a measure because we have a coupled economy. The economy, uh, we sell more stuff, we pollute more. Because we have a coupled economy, 
So when the GDP goes up, we're actually creating more problems that we need to fix. We should be celebrating when GDP goes down because it means that we've got fewer environmental problems to fix. There's a really nice indicator that a colleague, Catherine Trebek, has developed, which is number of girls on bikes and as, a, as an alternate to GDP. Because if you've got girls on bikes, it's a measure, it's a health indicator, it's a gender empowerment indicator, it's a measure of transport safety, it's a measure of multiple things in one indicator that are really important, whereas GDP tells us just how big and more polluted the environment is. We need to think about um, common indicators versus specific uh, indicators. Um, we have to start with common core comparable indicators and worry less to begin with about specific, what I would call supplementary um, indicators. Uh, but we tend to focus on the specific rather than the common. When we run these exercises, we focus on the sustainability of tourism, and that's not the issue. We should be focused on the, the contribution that tourism makes to sustainable development. So the sustainability of tourism is not important. <laughs> and apologies to colleagues uh, from the tourism industry. Uh, commercially, clearly, it's important to you, but from a public sector perspective, whose job it is to promote well-being, the role of tourism is to promote well-being. So it's about tourism's contribution to sustainable development, not the sustainability of tourism. And those are two very different things. So number of bed nights doesn't capture well-being uh, of the population. Um, <clears throat> we need to think about when we're measuring to report things, versus measurement for action. So, uh, and then I'll, and I'll include this last point about indicators for decision-making versus this culture of change. And so we need to really think about what it is that we're trying to achieve that measurement will help us with. So this is the why of indicators. Why are we measuring? The how and the what are very straightforward. They're technical exercises. They're not very straightforward, but those are those are things that are much more straightforward. Um, the the challenge is to think about why are we measuring? Uh, what sorry? Why are we? Uh, why do we have to? What is it we're trying to achieve? That measurement will help us, and then that's measurement for action rather than simply measurement for. The reporting and I think if we can focus on that then we'll develop a better set of indicators that have got more public political appeal that will actually help us to promote sustainability will be indicators worth having rather than doing a bottom-up approach which is what data have we got what can we measure how can we report it uh, and actually those don't really get picked up and they don't allow us to uh, to promote sustainability of development, they focus on the sustainability of tourism. So there's a set of thoughts there that are hopefully um, provoke people into, uh, into action and, and, and provoke a few ideas. I'm very keen to hear what people say. Um, but Teresa, I'll, um, I'll hand back to you on that point. Thank you so much, uh, Graham. I will actually take uh, over here. It's Lisa from uh, Visit Finland. Um, uh, Graham, um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your decades of work on uh, indicator uh, systems. And me too, on behalf of all of us, I think, all, or the sake of all of us, I also hope that before your reader systems kind of in tourism su success instead of just tourism share of GDP. A very relevant point uh, made here. Um, uh, since uh, we will be today in the later uh, discussions, we will be um, focusing on the environmental environmental impacts of uh, tourism. I want to um, uh, send you um, tricky questions. 
Like I know that you have seen the failures of the indicator systems, but have you seen any success cases of any destinations or any nations who have actually been utilized the environmental data in the indicator system so that they have been actually able to use the data in the decision maker in, in, in order to, to improve the destination? Yeah, I think there's, there's two interesting questions there. So systems that I think are quite interesting um, uh, and so I always would, would look to, to the systems that, that Canada has developed in Whistler, in Banff, where they've got those indicator systems that, you know, they make it into the newspapers. They, the store, when, the, when the data are produced, the, the results get picked up by the media. They, they produce them in the, in the newspapers. And it becomes then part of the sort of public policy making system. Um, so I think those are, are really interesting systems. And, but again, they've got indicators that, that look at what is important to people in their lives as people, not what is important to the tourism industry. Because if we focus on the tourism industry, we have to be honest, most people don't care about the tourism industry. So you know they would have an indicator, for example, that is about um, how long does it take me to get across town, uh, to take my kids to school. Um, so that's a measure of my well-being. Now, within that, if you can double the number of tourists, but it still takes me the same amount of time to get across town to drop my kids off at school, fine. I, I don't mind if you have double the number of tourists because you're managing it well. It's, it's not impacting negatively on my life. But if you have half the number of tourists, but they're all taking cars, they're all in my way uh, when I'm trying to take my children to school. Well, now I'm really annoyed with the tourism industry. You're negatively impacting on my life. And so the indicator of number of tourists is a terrible indicator for what's actually important to people's lives. So measure what's important to people's lives as the output indicator, not as an input indicator. So I would, I would look at those um, uh, those um, uh, those Canadian systems. I don't know if there's anybody from Visit Flanders on the call, but I really like the work that Visit Flanders have done with asking their community, what do you want this tourism industry to be? How many tourists do you want? What sort of volume of tourists? So this is about why do we have tourists? And once we've got that, an answer to that, why do we have tourists question, then you can think about really interesting ways of measuring that. But if you just start from the assumption that we're going to have tourists uh, and we're just gonna count how many that come, you're not really striking to the heart of what's important about tourism and the contribution it can make to, to well-being and welfare and the environment and all of those different sort of aspects of life. So yeah, there's, I, I, I very much hope that you're right that before I retire, there's an indicator system that, 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 that sticks. At the moment, I don't see it. I don't see a single system that's working. I see bits of them in different places, but not tourism specific, not tourism specific. Yes, thank you so much for that. And thank you for also for uh, provoking, uh, or at least hopefully provoking a lot of thinking about that. It's going back to your why that it shouldn't be that why um, um, and how we make things better for tourism, but improve how indeed how we take better into consideration the, the local communities. Um, there, there isn't any questions in the chat yet, uh, but however, there are many comments uh, saying that this is really relevant topic to them. And, and it's also a very punctual topic. So I really think that this is, again, an indicator of the fact that there will be indicator systems before you, re uh, before you retire. That also takes a better um, into consideration the, the destination um, community. Uh, as well as the environment. And uh, at this point, Graham, I really want to uh, thank you from all of our uh, behalf. This was really good start uh, for the date. And, um, uh, and I think that it brings a lot of thinking to all of us. And uh, then I would like to uh, invite our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Giovanni Finocchiaro.
from Italian Institute for Environmental Protection and Research. And Giovanni is going to tell us a little bit about what we should be doing with the data once we have finally managed to collect it. Welcome, uh, Giovanni. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you all for the invitation. And good morning, everyone. I am, uh, uh, yes, I am a statistician. I'm a lead of the statistical section of, uh, of HISPRA. I don't know if, okay, my presentation, okay. ISPRA is the Italian Institute for, for Environmental Protection Research, but uh, is a public institute for, that carry out both the task uh, of a national environmental agency and the National Environmental Research Institute. But I am also the co-chair of HIGIT, the interest group on environment and tourism of the HEPA network. Um, and uh, I attend to the, to the activities of the UNWTO expert group on measuring the sustainability of tourism. Today, I will briefly describe uh, um, the crucial importance of statistical data in managing the environmental dimension of tourism sustainability. So I have inevitably decided to start uh, with the definition of uh, sustainable tourism according to the UN, UNEP and the UNWTO guidelines, which emphasize the need for a constant balance of the three dimension of uh, sustainability. And uh, shifting, on, uh, uh, shifting to environmental, uh, environmental sustainability in the tourism sector, we can say that this concept uh, encompasses uh, an approach aimed at protecting natural landscape, uh, preserving biodiversity, and supporting the heritage of travel destination, thereby ensuring uh, their longevity and resilience for further generation. In this slide, uh, I aim to summarize the key principle of environmental sustainability in tourism, which include resource conservation, that is, preserve natural landscape and cultural heritage to maintain destination integrity, uh, impact reduction, um, so they minimize, they minimize the tourism environmental impact through uh, sustainable practices, and community engagement and educational awareness. Oh, mm, now, additionally, uh, beyond this, uh, this uh, defining aspect, uh, my presentation will focus on the environmental dimension of uh, the tourism sustainability and its measurement. Um, in, the, in, the, in this context, uh, uh, given the complex interplay between tourism and environment, uh, accurately measuring in their relationship is important for effectively managing tourist destination. This analysis needs key data on the use of natural resources, such as water, and uh, energy as uh, input uh, um, for the production of uh, the tourism industries. The use of environment uh, more generally as the setting uh, for tourism activities, the impact uh, and the pressure that the tourism activities exert on the environment, and the response that the tourism industries implement to reduce environmental pressure and improve environmental outcomes. So despite the current uh, the current understanding tourism study, except in some academia, academia context, uh, have largely focused on the economic aspect, uh, often overlooking its relationship uh, with the environment in a structured way. Uh, also, the official statistics uh, at European level also emphasize the economic factor, frequently adopting uh, an, an accounting approach to measuring tourism environmental impacts. And uh, now I will uh, explore the key experiences in measuring sustainable tourism, particularly its environmental aspect. So at the international level, um, um, there is a significant uh, focus on the statistical framework for measuring uh, sustainability for tourism uh, developed by a global expert uh, group to support the, the UNWTO and um, to which I contribute. But this uh, statistical framework was approved by UN Statistical Commission the last week in New York. And it aims to standardize the measurement of uh, tourism, economic, environmental, uh, social dimension across uh, uh, various scales and location. Under the, the system environmental economic account, this uh, multi-capital approach enhance sustainability assessment by incorporating uh, various uh, capital stocks and tourism benefit. I believe uh, especially for the environmental dimension, this important and useful accounting approach should also be paralleled, complemented by indicators. Also indicators derived from environmental monitoring activities. Uh, UNWTO seems to be moving towards this direction over the next few months. In fact, 
when the when WTO and its uh, expert group uh, should start working to develop a potential core set of sustainable tourism indicators for global adoption and uh, respect local specificities. So at European level, at European level, I'd like to mention, uh, first of all, the reason and increasing comprehensive European tourist dashboard by DigiGrow and uh, uh, developed with the support of a joint research center. This dashboard represents uh, an important turning point in Europe uh, in terms of uh, measuring all dimension of sustainability of the tourist sector. Besides, I mentioned my personal involvement in coordinating the EPA network interest group on environment and tourism, because this group aimed to promote the, the environmental dimension of sustainability and uh, of the tourist sector and its uh, measurement. We are working on uh, the identification of the key uh, information gaps and uh, basic data needs at European level to populate uh, relevant in the, and comparable, above all, indicators on tourism and environment. And this effort to raise awareness about um, awareness of the environmental aspect of tourism with a focus on uh, environmental pressure, impact, and measurement is crucial for Europe, um, where the current European tourism statistic regulation lacks any substantial reference to the environment or sustainability in general until, until now. Furthermore, um, I'd like to mention Eurostat recent announcement of an upcoming set of simple sustainable tourism indicators, primarily based on data managed by Eurostat. But I imagine that during the webinar, uh, Christoph De Munter will provide us with more up to the details. And lastly, in this slide, I have also included the, uh, somewhat older experiences because it's European initiative from 2018. My previous, uh, the previous presentation. Graham um, explained was one of the, 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 the principal investigator of this uh, of this activity. I wanted to bring it out up because uh, with its local focus, it remained a milestone, particularly in promoting the needs of, to monitor tourism sustainability. However, in my opinion, the, this valuable toolkit for tourism destination did not ensure the comparability of data necessary to populate the proposed indicator. Despite this, it has been and continue to be a useful experience for the municipality level. And despite the significant value of uh, the international experience I have just mentioned, we can assert that uh, while working on the identification and population of relevant and scientifically robust indicator for a subject is important, so okay, relevant and scientifically solid indicators, it's equally important to answer a common methodology for populating the indicators, but um, um, but I think that it's important. However, is uh, what is truly essential is bridging the current information gap on uh, common basic data to various European countries, which is necessary for developing relevant and comparable. Above all, I underline again comparable indicators. Uh, therefore, it became crucial, for example, to identify which environmental information could be derived from current official tourism statistical surveys by integrating uh, suitable questions, or just as could be important to direct the current environmental uh, monitoring activities towards the tourism sector. This is, in my opinion, uh, is the real priority in terms of measurement, as uh, addressing new information needs cannot always really hone data collected for entirely different purposes. In other words, uh, um, there needs to be a clear a directive that if, for instance, we aim to assess, uh, I don't know, the transition toward the circularity of the tourism sector, and there be all the ensuing environmental and economic benefit for both the sector and the host territories, or if, for example, the goal is to assist territorial governments in adapting to or mitigating the impacts of climate change on tourism, Specialized data collection efforts are necessary in order to meet this specific objective. And this consideration applies to the entire ecosystem, tourism ecosystem. However, um, at the supplier level, data related to the application of environmental criteria provided by environmental certification could be an excellent uh, data set to be collected uniformly at European level. And, uh, obviously um, extendable, extendable to similar but uncertified tourism operator. In this way, 
homogeneous environmental data specific to the environmental consumption of accommodation facility and or tourism operator in general will be collected. When I speak about environmental consumption, I mean uh, such as water, electricity, land use, waste, for example. And uh, this, uh, uh, this information would be collected useful for populating indicators on tourism and environment that are comparable at the European level. Besides the assistance experiences in measuring the sustainability of the, the business, the private sector could represent concrete experiences for those responsible for collecting official statistics on what, on where, and how to find certain useful information for this purpose. But the next speakers will talk more about this point. Finally, we believe that collecting accurate and sharing data is essential to inform, enhance visitors' experiences and positively impact the environment and the society. And that this requires a policy direction on gathering relevant statistical data for tourism and the environment. Equally important, in my opinion, is reducing data fragmentation, this uh, enhancing uh, uh, synergy in data governance at the European level uh, among the main institutions tasked with collecting official statistics on environment and on tourism. For example, Eurostat collects data from tourism and also um, something about the environment, but for environment, there are also European Environmental Agency, Joint Research Center that lead specific data, data center. In conclusion, allow me to uh, end with this call to support and to promote the environmental dimension of sustainability of the tourism sector. I think we need these four main keywords that could lead in the right direction, above all about the measurement of these teams. And they are research, necessary to improve knowledge, and to do this, data are fundamental. And uh, these three aspects uh, can guarantee the awareness, environmental awareness uh, necessary to approach in a structural way this thing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Giovanni Pinotaro, for, for your uh, presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have time now for, for, for questions. We are really in a, in a delay. So uh, I will post you one question that, so you have time to think about it for the uh, discussion session. And it will be what kind of indicators, in your opinion, would be useful to measure the impact really on, uh, on, on environment, but in the sense of nature? Nature, if there are any, or what kind of them could be useful. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ioannis Papas, he's the director of the Mediterranean region at the GCTC, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. Uh, please, Ioannis, uh, the floor is yours. Can you show your screen? Thank you. All right. So, good morning to everyone. Uh, I hope that uh, you can see my screen. Nice. All right. Thank you. So I am Ioannis Papas. I'm coming from uh, Global Sustainable Tourist Council, and I will try in the next 10 minutes, let me put my timer, <clears throat> to uh, actually continue the discussion that we have started from the earlier speakers. So uh, before I'm starting, uh, I'm going to focus and let me say that uh, I'm, I'm, I will try to connect what we have heard already with the standards, with actually the certification and the process towards that because my actually organization is focused on that. So what is about GSTC? It's a Global Sustainable Tourist Council, like uh, Teresa said, uh, which is managing the GSTC criteria, Global Standards Sustainable Travel and Tourism. But also we are also for forcing and focusing on international accreditation about uh, sustainable tourism certification bodies. This is very technical. However, it's very critical also connected with the oncoming actually new legislation. So let me uh, try to say something about uh, what we have said already about KPIs, about performance indicators. And I'm focusing on performance because it's very crucial for us. So finally in the market and actually in the real world, because uh, I really I am coming from research. However, if you go to actually to the real world and the market, uh, these guys are really asking for real data, for real tools, for something that is really in the market and it's operating. So we need to have something simple connected with management of the of the, actually of the market with something which is going to be fast and cheap and 
awareness, of course, to share that with stakeholders because we focus on the tourist sector. It's a huge uh, supply chain that we have to deal with that. So in reality, we are focusing and asking for realistic and very reliable, actually, KPIs in order to be connected with the organization goals and the brand itself, because this is something that everyone knows and sells really in the market. We're going to hear more about that from the from the other uh, speakers in the next. However, it is very interesting to see and discuss about that in order to have what? Positive environmental change. This is the concept that we are underlying under this uh, web. It's also a general demand. And of course, we have to have something which is simple, simple and comprehensive at the same time. Uh, I'm following also what Graham said in the beginning. However, we need to connect that in real life. And these are some cases that someone can see in the market about energy. I'm talking about environmental sustainability right now, energy intensity, water intensity, carbon intensity. All these numbers are already in the market. And most probably right now, many of you have seen that based on what you are uh, working and going and have a hotel or uh, using, let's say, transportation mean. But how we can create that? Because this is the discussion that we have today. So we can start and taking from the, let's say, of the knowledge base of good practices and many other things on the left a project that we have supported in a European project in eco-cruising future that we are focusing on cruising lines and how we can take for good practices, good ideas about KPIs. However, in any way, we have to see inside these indicators, materiality assessment, it would be should be meaningful and uh, have an impact. It should be this fight between qualitative and quantitative approach. And of course, this should be connected also with standards. And this is a very big discussion that cannot open really today. However, let me scratch on the surface about that. So is that, I mean, a standard is really a suitable tool for introducing KPIs? Is it something that we can discuss on? Yes, definitely. I see, I, I gave, I'm giving here the example of the GSTC standard, but also all the other standards around the, at least the tourist sector are connected with KPIs and criteria. So what we have here, we have for sure indicators. We have indicators in different kinds of uh, subsector, sub, uh, let's say areas like management, economic and social, cultural, environmental. However, we have to be very careful because not all the criteria or slash indicators are really useful in the sense of use it in order to identify in a qualitative way what exactly or what exactly is the, let's say, the number that we're asking for, for example, the evolution of uh, energy per guest night or per square meter. So we have to be very careful about that. So is a process that is boosting data collection, because this is also a very important thing we're discussing about, um, let's say, criteria and indicators. Are the sustainable certification processes a boosting mechanism? Definitely is, because in reality, when someone is going for certification, should mention, should measure most of the times and create evidences from their real life, what exactly is going on with specific, let's say, indicators, for example, energy reduction targets. In order to identify a target, like Grandma said, we have to identify an indicator to use this indicator to collect data and then create targets and monitoring that. So we have to have all these nice things like a monitoring system, like a connection with spending items, like if we're talking about private sector, but also in, in public sector. And all this should be connected also with IT solutions. Don't forget that because in reality, if we are not connecting real life with, uh, let's say, the indicators and the criteria and everything, together with digitalization, smart cities, smart companies, whatever you call it, we are going to have a big, a big gap over there. So let me give you two examples in order to, uh, let's say, finalize my uh, very brief, uh, actually, presentation. So this is a very interesting thing. I think I would like to, to share with you because it gives exactly what is happening 
now in the market connected also with standardization, certification, and also KPIs. So this is the most, let's say, the well-known booking.com uh, platform that has been, in, uh, let's say, implemented in their system uh, the way to, let's say, to um, to find uh, a place to stay uh, based on sustainability, uh, let's say, features, or let's say good practices related to sustainability. Uh, all right, so they have named it the Travel Sub Sustainable Bud, and it is, uh, let's say, related more or less right now with more than 1.5 million accommodation, 1.5 million, all right? So this is a situation that we have for the last uh, almost two years. However, look what is happening where we are connecting the development of regulation like the green claims together with this kind of uh, situation. Some days ago, this platform announced to the whole market of, let's say, the hoteliers, so every hotelier received this, that is going to, let's say, uh, take away all the different levels of, uh, let's say, um, achievement about good practice, etc., with only two phases. One, you have good practices, and the other one, that you are going to be inside the certified, actually, by third-party um, uh, entities. This is very important because, in reality, they are forcing the market to go to the certification, so standards, so KPIs. Think about how you are going to prove that you are, let's say, sustainable enough in that sense. So standards and certification based on third party, which is also the heart of the Greek claims that are coming, are really, really making a big effort inside, let's say, the market. And how someone can prove that GSTC is going to, uh, let's say, to support uh, information about certifications, uh, all around the world, but also in, in Europe, we are going to have the dashboard, but also software provides like because that are going to connect the hotels, let's say a performance together with the OTAs, these platforms. So the KPIs are critical in this actually game because from now it's going to be, let's say quasi real time, but in the future, in a smart hotel, in IT, let's say, world, this is going to be real time. So in environmental and not only social and everything, we are going to have, an, uh, let's say, demand from the supply chain of tourism to have this data in place. And closing with this actually um, slide, because this is the continuation of what I have uh, actually presented earlier, because everything now is about data. From the left part, you see the certification bodies that are around now in the world, most, uh, let's say, well-known and prestigious. And on the other side, you have the OTAs and everything that are sharing information to the visitor, to the destination visitor, to the tourist, let's say, sector. And in the middle, you have to create, if it's going to be GSTC, it's going to be the European, let's say, dashboard, it's going to be all the, all, let's say, the, the shareholders of this data universe, we have to create this data. We have to based on reliable, actually, uh, KPIs. And we have to do it now because right now already the market is there and the consumer like me and you are asking for that. So I'm stopping here and I thank you very much uh, for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Ianis, for your uh, presentations. Very, uh, very insightful and um... Uh, since we are a little bit over our time, this is not our speaker's fault, but uh, this is the organizer's uh, uh, fault. Uh, but I hope that we can take still uh, some uh, some minutes to um, to. I have some questions for you, and then hopefully we can have a discussion together with all our speakers. Uh, so first of all, there was a question for you in the chat about the um, national labels and the certification schemes that what about after the EU green uh, claims directive, if that comes to the, uh, uh, that will these schemes still be valid after EU green claims comes to valid? This is for who? For me? This yes, this is for you. All After right. this, we will go to a discussion together. Yeah, yeah. This was, I, uh, I think yeah. I think with the uh, let's say the slide with uh, the case of Booking.com, everyone now is looking for to be compliant with uh, let's say legislation like green claims. So they have to be just to be sure and justify 
Otherwise, it's going to be a big mess, not in the market only, but also in the organizational, let's say, status of these big uh, giants of tourism, uh, that they are compliant. So they have to be sure that everything is reliable, everything is based on, on uh, the terms of, uh, let's say, what is exactly certification, what the third party and everything. This is going, the, I mean, the, me the mechanism in order to achieve that could be also bottom up. So it's going to start from the market itself. The example is related with that, or it could be top down. So the na on the national level, uh, the nations, uh, member states, and not only should have taken the measures in the next, let's say, period in order to become reliable and not to be open on any kind of claims and go to the courts. Because you can see the, let's say the, let's say the thread behind. If we don't have reliable indicators, we don't have certification and processes that are really acknowledged and reliable, then there is a big trap because of the good, the good, let's say, legislation that is a green claims, because we have to put an order on this market. Thank you so much. And then um, uh, I think that all our speakers are uh, here. So I would have a little bit questions related to that to you all. Um, because some of the, if you're talking about uh, whether it's in a national level or in an EU level or uh, or even in a, in the supplier level, um, many times the data is not available, so it's not openly accessible. So what about what it comes to, for example, the green claims or in general uh, to to comparability? What the earlier speakers were also uh, uh, bringing up. So uh, how, how can we how can we compare? How can we be transparent and how can we be open if this data is not available? For example, if it's uh, held by a, by a private body. And even if you can, Yannis, um, give you insights on this because uh, you work so closely with the certification bodies. But I would also welcome the thoughts on this on Giovanni yes. and Graham. If I may not take more time for myself, I just want to say that. Um, Right now, there are mixed, uh, let's say, models. There are models that uh, the nations are taking into account, uh, let's say, taking the top-down, like I said, the model. However, it is the mentality of the people also in the countries and the destination, because uh, like we, we said, we have to see the pyramid from the nation to the destination and the destination to the private sector, the whole supply chain. So it's a matter of the mentality, but also from the road, the let's say the roadmap and the pathway that each member state would like to follow. Otherwise, we can have only one system and never is going to be ready. But this is not the case. But about Giovanni, do you have thoughts on this? Yes, I agree with Ioannis in the sense that uh, it's necessary to, to, to put on the table all the data to guarantee the, the, the main things, that is the comparability. Because when you... Uh, study, when you analyze, when you compare information for destination, for national level, is need the comparability because otherwise everything, every every context that you can do your exercise with your little core set of indicator, but uh, is uh, only an exercise, an autonomous exercise that you can compare both with the other country, with the other destination. So absolutely is need, is necessary to, to improve this aspect. So to have a, a, a direction to to know which kind of data we have to collect and for measure what. This is important. About the Teresa question about the impact to measure nature, in particular the natural aspect. Uh, okay, also in that also in that context, uh, we need to monitor, for example, we need the, the arches, uh, the, the people that arches in this uh, in this uh, natural natural parks, natural reservation, the the activity that that, uh, that uh, in that natural area we uh, they done, but we don't have this uh, data to comparable the at at European level. So the the problem is, uh, in my opinion, is not uh, indicator the methodology, but uh, the data, the common data basic. I repeat, uh, is my mantra now. I think that, but yeah. <laughs> I repeat this because is the first step. The first step to collect together to 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 measure, to approach, to analyze also new uh, um new uh, element of this uh, relationship between tourism and environment. Um, from a, an example, a practical example from a, from an environmental point of view, uh, to study this kind of area, for example, uh, there is a, speak about natural natural area, 
Um, we can use at European level at least every three years, uh, use for the Copernicus data. We can uh, we can use the soil consumption on uh, the soil consumption on the natural area. We use in Italy, in particular for tourism, and a um, similar indicator for the soil consumption in the uh, coastal area because uh, in Italy is it more important the the coastal area for for our kind of of uh, tourism. But uh, this is uh, every three years, uh, the Copernicus data are available for all the European countries. So it could be a, a useful suggestion to go, but uh, it's important that someone say, or the country say, that uh, it's necessary to monitor this aspect. So um, I will let you, I will go, go back to that, uh, that uh, point about the um, uh, base, like a positive environmental uh, um, impact. I will have just uh, uh, one more, one final question on that. But before we go to that, I would like to hear Graham's um, uh, viewpoint on this original question, because we understand that we need to have a common data that is comparability. Uh, but Graham, like you mentioned, that this is what ethics was created and it wasn't really widely uh, implemented. And you also mentioned that uh, the country, countries that um, implemented it wanted the data to their context instead of common indicators that are comparable. So do you have like thoughts on this and how, how do we tackle this? Yeah, and I say so there's a tension here, isn't there, between uh, wanting things that are very specific to our destination um, and that does go to my other point um, about making it relevant to the local population, getting local media interest. So the one way we can do that is by making it very specific to our destination. I think, but, but this is where we all have to just lift our heads a little bit and see ourselves. Yes, we're a, we're a community uh, and we have our own particular issues. But we're part of humanity. Uh, we're part of a bigger thing here. Uh, and we have to have some attention to the collective good and not just our individual or very destination specific good. And I, I do think it's our responsibility as, as educated people who understand about sustainability, many work in the public sector, to say we have a collective responsibility beyond just our immediate mandate to say, there's things that I have in common with you just because you're in Finland and I'm here in Portugal, but we share water, we share air, we share climate, we share all of energy futures, we share concern about people. And so we need to just collect data on those things so that we can compare so that then I can learn you're doing really well, we're doing really badly. I can talk to you and find out why it is that you're doing really well and how I can improve my performance and so I think there is a I know it's not very fashionable and it's not very trendy uh, to, to think about being selfless uh, and to think about being collective but I do think when it comes to these indicators we have to think uh, a part of us has to think a little bit more collectively and we, we measure for that reason rather than just specific to our destination. Yeah, I think that that was a very good reminder to us all that we have to be more collective and also to re remember that, for example, in EU, we are all one community. So it goes beyond the, the destination uh, borders. I have one final and not yeah. so easy question for you before we uh, we break up. And it comes to the, uh, comes to the topic that also Teresa brought up earlier. I know we may not have data, but if we had data, would there be any indicators you would like to see in use that which would allow us to measure the positive impact of tourism? And now I would like to see environmental impacts here or environmental indicators. Uh, and indicators that do not just simply reduce the negative impact, but would actually allow us to measure positive impact. Graham, if you start and we go then to okay. Giovanni and Ionis. I know and this is not an easy one, but... But it's like you're looking into my brain, Lisa, about what I'm thinking about at the moment. So this concept of regeneration um, is, is really interesting because is it... When, when you read what people write about regeneration, it's more of an ideology. So 
John Elkington, who developed the idea of the triple bottom line, he says that this is an ideology and we have to start thinking in a regenerative way in order to be sustainable, that we can't be sustainable if we don't start by thinking differently about the world. Ideologies are very difficult to measure uh, and certainly the concept of regenerative business regenerative tourism hasn't really yet got to the idea of how do we measure or should we measure? Now, one argument is that religion is an ideology, but that has principles. We can, we can at least, we have commandments, we can at least, you know, assess uh, to some extent religiosity against adherence to those, uh, those principles, those commandments. So, I don't think it's impossible to begin to measure regeneration and to, to measure ideology, but I do think it's different than just sustainability. I don't think it's, I don't think we go in a line from having a negative impact, having a less negative impact, having a positive impact. I think regeneration requires us to think differently about the world, connection with nature, connection with other people, uh, why are we here? Are we trying to grow? Are we trying to be bigger or are we just trying to be happier and have more well-being? I think that takes us down a fundamentally different road. And somewhere on that road, there are some indicators, but, uh, but we're not there yet. But I'd be delighted to have that conversation with people who want to think about how we measure regeneration. Thank you, Graham. I also hope that we are... Uh, slowly going to that, uh, actually not anymore slowly, but quickly going towards that pathway. Uh, Giovanni, would you like to add something to that? Yes, absolutely. It's not negative because uh, environmental aspects uh, are, the, 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 the tourism is a, a demographic pressure, first of all. So uh, all this information are important for the territory, for the who govern the territory at all the levels. So it's important to know how this pressure, demographic pressure, have to manage the, for the territory. So it's not a, a negative aspect. In my, in, I, I, during my presentation, I give some, uh, some suggestion about the important, for example, in true recent uh, uh, environmental uh, topics, uh, uh, circular economy and climate change. Circular economy is not only an environmental aspect, it's economy. So the transition towards a, a, a circular approach in the tourism sector, um, um, I think that it is important to, to do understand that, that there are sure environmental benefits, but also economic benefits. So are a positive approach in this aspect, but it's necessary to measure this new emerging aspect. So uh, this is my opinion. Thank you so much, Giovanni. So we have uh, traveled from a regenerative economy to a circular economy. Um, Ionis, I'm really looking forward to your thoughts on that. Will, will we be seeing this in a GSTC standard maybe in the near future? Uh, you know, the, the creation of a standard is a very big uh, issue, at least for the GSTC. Uh, it is an open consultation, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of experience for every person that is active in the research, in the market, and everyone. So uh, right now, uh, in, at least in GSTC, we are developing mice and attraction uh, criteria together with already established uh, for hotels, I mean, the industry, uh, hotels, tour operators, and also destinations. However, you know, uh, we have to do, we have to see how the flows going in uh, in the, uh, let's say in in real life, and I think we are going to see in the near future many other uh, items that are also related with uh, let's say hot issues like regenerative tourism or even gastronomy or whatever is that. Just to mention because I was seeing the the the, the questions. Um, it is very important right now, and because of this regulation, to identify really what is certification. And there were some, uh, uh, let's say, questions in the in the audience. Uh, it is really specifically defined what is certification by ISO, by many different international organizations. In the next year, in the next time, not years, in the in the in the next period, we are going to see a very big difference 
in the market about that, what exactly is happening in the market, because even because of the green claims regulation, uh, there should be, uh, let's, say, a, let's say, a clearing in the market, what is what. And this is going to change a lot also the need for KPIs for indicators, because by the end of the day, like in my presentation you saw, this is going to be connected straight with uh, data collection and, and indicators. And I think that is not going to be only in the market of the private sector, but also it's going to be faced also in the whole supply chain, like in destinations and many others. So it's going to be a very interesting period that we're going to see because of European uh, uh, regulation, also as a, a pioneer in a global, let's say, changes. Thank you uh, so much, Ionesta. Uh, That's a very positive to hear uh, that uh, this will be. This is what we will be seeing in the certifications as well. Um, it shows to me that uh, based on these discussions, that uh, the future future will hold us um, potentially some solutions that how for tourism to create. Uh, positive uh, environmental impacts for the destinations. I, and I think that this is something, this is the hope that we have to hold on and work very hard towards it. And uh, with these words, I will uh, give the floor to Teret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really positive uh, for uh, for us coming from the protected areas. Well, to see to, to hear all these positive uh, uh, inputs about the uh, tourism and uh, positive impacts uh, for nature. I'm just really sorry because we are really, really in a delay and such interesting topics. So. First thing, we will skip the break. It's, 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 it's uh, of course, people can do whatever they want, but uh, we will uh, continue. Uh, so uh, please, uh, because now we need to hear also the, the perspective of the DG Grow and, and what is really interesting also, the perspective from, from, from the industry. So uh, it is my pleasure to, to give the floor now to Christophe Demonter uh, from, the, from the Eurostat, the statistical agency from the European Union. Please, uh, Christoph, if you can share your screen. Hi, good morning. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to share the screen. I don't know if it works. Yeah, we, we see your slides as always we see the small ones, but it's not a big issue, eh? No, we, I we can, Okay, yeah. perfect. Oh, yeah, Thank we you. tried early okay. on. So sorry about yeah. this. Um, so good morning. Um, yeah. Uh, Teresa said uh, this was about the, uh, the views also of GROW. Uh, I work for the statistical component of the commission, uh, named the Eurostat. And now I, yeah. Um, I think before we uh, we go into indicators, we need to know uh, what we want to measure. And I think this was already mentioned by some speakers um, earlier on. I think Giovanni also referred to the work of the WTO, even the World Tourism Organization. Uh, there was a, a work of, of more than five, six years on trying to come up with a conceptual framework to to measure the uh, sustainability of tourism. Uh, as was said, this framework was adopted by the UN Statistics Commission uh, last week. So it's some kind of milestone. Uh, of course, the framework, it's a, it's a conceptual framework. It's laying down uh, general principles, definitions, uh, concepts on how to measure um, the sustainability of tourism. Uh, it's not a list of operational indicators. This will be the next uh, the next uh, batch of homework for WTO and the uh, and the countries. But at least, uh, I mean, I know that the colleagues at WTO are very happy with this um, milestone that they achieved because getting all the noses in the same direction, it was uh, not an easy task. Um, I'm, I can go to some of the slides quite quickly because the Giovanni was so kind to already take some of my uh, points. Uh, the colleagues in Grow asked me to include something on the EU tourism dashboard in this presentation. Uh, I hope many of you are already familiar with the dashboard. Uh, if not, uh, please have a look uh, later today, whenever you have the time. Uh, it's some kind of online tool gathering information in, a, in some kind of dashboard uh, setting. Uh, it characterizes European uh, tourism destinations in relation to three pillars, uh, green, uh, digital, and socioeconomic resilience. Uh, it's it's a work in progress. It's a, it's a growing initiative. Uh, every year, it's it's being uh, fine tuned and updated with new indicators, with uh, uh, refined indicators. Currently, there's about thirty indicators that are updated annually. It covers the EU and the uh, EFTA countries. Uh, many indicators are at national level, some also at the region level, because of course, the the more we go to the regional level, the more the discussion on sustainability uh, becomes relevant and and uh, I mean more tangible. 
Um, as it was also said by Giovanni, this is uh, the, the colleagues behind this dashboard are the colleagues from DG Grow and the Joint Research Center. Uh, of course, in cooperation with the member states, because and this is maybe where the the Y component comes in. The uh, the member states through the uh, tourism advisory committee are consulted on what are the, actually the dimensions that should be uh, uh, primarily measured. Uh, lots of the data behind the dashboard comes from us from Eurostat, but there's also quite some of the on by the JRC in terms of modeling using big data sources, uh, in particular to uh, to overcome the problem that. Um, uh, identifying the tourism component of all these uh, flows is not always easy, but I come back to this later as well. Um, just to give an example, uh, the, these are the indicators for this uh, so-called green pillar, uh, air travel emission, uh, share of train by trips, and so on. Um, the sustainability, it's not only in this green pillar, also, also in the digital pillar, it's about uh, skill, uh, digital skills in the in the sector, uh, in the socioeconomic pillar, it's about tourism intensity, uh, dependence on top regions, uh, and so on, expenditure, which is then, of course, again, more the economic components. Beside these three pillars, there's also some, let's say, basic tourism descriptors, the, the traditional date of uh, night spent, uh, capacity in terms of bed places, and so on. Uh, also, there, there's a few that can be linked to uh, sustainability. But as I said, for full information, please uh, visit the dashboard. They also have very good methodological notes on the indicators, how they are composed, and so on. Now we come to, uh, to our work. Um, some people already mentioned that we also have an initiative on trying to build an indicator system. And as both uh, Graham and Giovanni said uh, before me, there have been many uh, attempts to measure uh, sustainability of tourism. Uh, I think 15 years ago, there was a tourism sustainability grow at, uh, at the time, the gender prize. Uh, I think it is also came out of that. Uh, so it's a bit of a, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a long bumpy road to, to get something. Uh, the approach we are now taking, it's um, to build uh, an indicator system based on existing data. We have, uh, as you might know, uh, a huge uh, gold mine or mine of data at Eurostat, not only in the area of tourism. So what we want to do is to, to reuse uh, most, I mean, to the extent possible, the existing data. Uh, the, first I, the, the first step is to get some well, as we call it, low-hanging fruits. So we have uh, harmonized data on, on, on businesses, on tourism, uh, on labor markets that we want to exploit to come up with indicators linked to sustainability of tourism. Uh, then we want to see if we can develop these further. I mean, we can deepen them, we can widen them by, I mean, widening the scope, uh, going more granular in terms of uh, geographical granularity, temporal granularity. Uh, but I also come back to that in a moment. So the first indicator that we that we want to to produce, uh, hopefully still this year, uh, it's to be seen as a as a kickoff. We know there are shortcomings. Uh, I will also come back to that in a minute. Uh, but as was already mentioned, one of the things that is needed is uh, comparable indicators, harmonized indicators. So we hope by using existing harmonized data that we can get there. I mean, harmonized data. It's it's important because you want to. Um, compare or to benchmark, not to benchmark necessarily as a, some kind of a competition or hit parade of sustainable destinations, but also to look at uh, which countries or regions score quite well on a certain indicator and how can we learn from that, how can we ex uh, exchange uh, best practices. So this is of course the uh, one of the motivations to have this ind indicator set to see what specific dimensions some regions are doing better and what are the uh, policy initiatives or, or um, uh, enterprise or tourist behavior behind this. Uh, the idea is to have this indicator set interoperable with the tourism dashboard. We don't want to duplicate the, uh, the work of other colleagues in the commission. So we are in close contact with the colleagues in, uh, in GROW and the JRC. Uh, we also try to align as much as possible to the uh, to the international framework that I mentioned. Of course, not everything in international framework is is compatible with a specific European situation. Uh, we we try to rely as much as possible on the uh, concepts uh, laid down there. Um, one important thing, and it was also mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, in, in this context of our indicator sustainability, it's it's much wider than only environmental dimension. Uh, we distinguish five dimensions. Uh, economy, labor markets, uh, and I, I will come to it. For economy, we uh, you easily go to the to the typical uh, indicators of a tourism GDP um, uh, or growth of tourism GDP compared to other sectors. Um, and yeah, of course, Graham made some interesting points on, on the, the relevance of, of or the irrelevance of, of that indicator, but that's also why we want to have a 
a set of quite a number of indicators to, I mean, not to have a focus only on the economic com uh, uh, component. Um, just for information, uh, I mean, Graham will not like to hear it, but the, uh, the colleagues behind this, they're called DG Grow. They used to be called DG Enterprise, now they're called DG Grow. So the focus on the growth seems to be very uh, strong still these days. Uh, a second component is uh, about labor markets, uh, which is uh, both about performance, but also about uh, the, the uh, goes into the, so the social dimension. Uh, we know that tourism is in particular a sector that gives chances to people who not always uh, have good chances in other sectors of the uh, of the economy, uh, the migrant population, uh, lower educated people, and so on. So we also want to include some indicators on on comparing the share of these specific groups in the tourism labor market compared to the overall labor market. Uh, comparing earnings, looking at uh, job vacancy rates in, in specific sectors. Uh, a bit more difficult to measure its uh, social and cultural impact. Uh, we have an indicator in our data on participation in tourism. It's the, the, the share of the population that actually makes tourism trips. Uh, it, it's not only a, um, a measure of access because there's also people who are simply not interested in traveling. They're happy to spend their holidays in their own garden. They don't need to take planes or to visit new places, but it's, it is still a relevant indicator. Uh, night spent is a, is a traditional indicator, but if you relate it to uh, the, the number of people who actually live in the place or the area of the place, it, it brings a new perspective. Uh, of course, an environment is one of the, uh, the dimensions, which is unfortunately the more difficult one to measure. And I think we're all uh, aware of that channel. Uh, that uh, challenge. And finally, also because if it's one of the uh, priorities of the Commission, there's also a component on, uh, there will also be a component on digitalization. So some of these indicators are already included in the um, in the dashboard. Uh, we take IDs from the dashboard and, and vice versa. So, so far the uh, cooperation works really fine. The challenges, that's always a bad news. Uh, with these indicators, there's definitely an issue with representativeness. We cannot cover all the dimensions in the same way. Some, some aspects may be over uh, represented, others may be a bit underrepresented. So it's, it's also a matter of communicating to users that this is uh, there. Uh, there's also a bias. Uh, we had the, um, we mentioned it a few times, the indicator of the number of nights spent. This typically relates to accommodation, uh, which means you by default exclude from a definition the same day visitors, which might actually be part of the tourists that's creating pressure on a given day on top of the presence of, uh, of the residential tourists, of the, uh, I mean, of the tourists who stay more than one day. Uh, of course, tourists staying in non-rented accommodation, for instance, second homes, they're also not covered in that data. And in some areas where the people with a second home, of course, this might uh, lower the relevance of the indicator. Uh, we know that there's a problem with granularity in terms of sectoral coverage, uh, especially um, distinguishing within a, an economic sector what part is linked to tourists, what is not. Um, in terms of geographical breakdown, uh, we cannot always go to the destination level, and this is often where uh, things happen in tourism. Uh, also temporal granularity, of course, uh, seasonality is a huge issue. So all indicators that would be based on the annual level have um, a built-in shortcoming. We try to improve um, uh, infra-annual data to, to, to measure seasonality as well. Uh, and of course, this system, since it's based on official statistics, the typical more subjective indicators, um, and I think uh, I think it was Graham who was referring to work of Visit Flanders, so measuring uh, attitudes of locals towards tourism, it, it is relevant in its context, but this is typically not covered by uh, official statistics. Uh, finally, it's work in progress. Uh, we're also uh, on limited resources, so we try to, to progress as, as good as possible on this. Uh, finally, uh, I mean, I work in Tourism statistics at Eurostat, there's also a, a department dealing with environmental statistics, and they also gave some, some input to conclude uh, the presentation. Uh, there are uh, statistics on environmental impacts that might have relevance for tourism, uh, greenhouse, uh, gas emission, energy use, uh, even by type of product, waste generation, air pollution. Uh, this sounds nice. Of course, the uh, the big uh, issue is that uh, this is available by economic activity, but it's not always easy to distinguish the tourism part in an economic activity. For accommodation, it's relatively easy. For passenger air transport, it might be easy. Uh, for other parts, it's not uh, even if you have train transport separately for passengers. You don't know what is commuters. You don't know what is tourists. So this is a, this remains a big challenge. Um, 
So, and the last thing uh, in this context is uh, linking tourism satellite accounts and environmental accounts might bring part of the solution, but uh, both components, uh, TSA and SEA, are quite uh, underdeveloped or under development. So, uh, first, these need to be fully fledged um, systems, and only then we can think of uh, a serious way of, of linking them. Um, on environmental accounts, it's again the same. There's lots of data on, uh, for instance, air emissions by detailed economic activities, but it's not sufficiently detailed to uh, to distinguish the uh, the tourism part. And as long as we can't do that, it's of course tricky to say something about tourism without uh, too much uh, vagueness or uncertainty in, in what we put out. And uh, finally, I think this this is the last slide. There's some other environmental statistics that might be relevant. Uh, physical energy flows, again, available for many products, but not always easy to distinguish uh, what is tourism, what is not tourism, uh, carbon footprints, based. Wanted to say in these uh, 10 minutes that was allocated to, to us. I just want to slide, uh, to end with a slide that I took um, on our to be holidays recently, just to make a smooth transition to uh, the next speaker. Thanks for your attention. And if there's questions, I don't know if we take them now or later on, that I leave to Teresa. Thank you, uh, Christoph. And uh, first of all, to answer your question, uh, we will take the questions in the in the end then for the final uh, discussion. So you can, you will also have some uh, time to prepare for the questions in the uh, chat. Um, and, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I think this is really like answering the, one of the challenges that has been brought up by uh, most of the speakers. So the, the lack of comparability. So the statistics that you were just showing us to allow us that uh, to, to compare uh, some, of the, some of the data on the national level. Uh, and also, for example, to EU averages. And um, I just wanted to also say that I can really relate to the challenges that uh, that you have faced in this work. That uh, that uh, the challenges of gathering uh, relevant information, or or also the information that would be available and in, uh, in all uh, countries. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Christoph. And uh, today we've been talking a lot about what what like what matters, that what kind of data we should be actually uh, collecting and analyzing. And uh, next speaker is uh, Ian Corbett from TUI, as Christopher just mentioned, and he will indeed tell us about um, about measuring what matters and how TUI is tackling this in practice. Welcome so much, uh, Ian Corbett. Thank you, um, and hello everybody. Um, I'm just, hopefully, I'm in full screen mode, right? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, okay, so yeah, so um, what I would like to do is just spend um, 10 minutes explaining how we, as a, um, as a major private sector organisation, approach this. So just uh, very briefly for anyone um, who doesn't know TUI, we are a global uh, travel and tourism group, uh, 19 million customers and uh, operate across uh, a airline, crews, hotels, travel agencies and tour operators. So, um, so we, are, um, we, are uh, we are big, we are global uh, and therefore we are always looking to approach this uh, in as consistent a way as we can across our different verticals and across our different geographies. Um, it's it's not too dissimilar, this, some of this slide actually, to where Graham started. So in terms of where TUI started with, um, with ESG data and sustainability reporting, um, we actually set up what we thought was the first or what we think is the first environmental management unit back in the 90s and then from then onwards, we've started to report some kind of metrics. So getting on for the 30 years that um, that, that Graham mentioned. Um, and then the, the way that we've kind of collected this and managed our data has also moved and evolved with the times. Um, so for just over 10 years, we've been doing it via a um, specialist data reporting solution. 
um, apart from a bump during COVID where we did try to go back and go old school and do it via uh, Microsoft Excel and, and online surveys, which, which was a very painful process. Um, so yeah, so we are now back to using um, an automated solution wherever we can to simplify it. And also as I'll come on to later, um, pick up on some of the points that have been mentioned earlier that we're not, some of it is about reporting for reporting sake, but also it's about driving um, insight and driving change on the back of that data. So in terms of how we um, approach this, trying to decide what, what to measure, right? Um, so that I, I said measuring what matters, how do we decide what matters? So we are trying to balance a number of competing needs and requirements. So um, so on the on the first, on the one hand, we do include as part of our uh, non-financial declaration in our annual report some of our key um, sustainability metrics, including environmental metrics. So those are our core metrics, which are the ones um, that go into the annual report and accounts, and obviously the link there to TCFD. Um, we are also members of a number of voluntary frameworks, um, the most notable of which at the moment being the Science-Based Target Initiative. So as the TUI group, we have set science-based reduction targets for our airline, our cruise and our hotel businesses. Um, so there's an awful lot of focus in terms of our emissions data and improving the frequency of that so that we can really track a monitor our progress against our publicly stated targets under SBTI and also uh, we are um, members of the advisory board of the global tourism plastic initiative so again we're aligning our plastic uh, reporting to the GTPI and really wherever we can uh, we are looking for that alignment with standardized frameworks provided um, that they work on an international basis. So as I say, I know that's not always entirely possible, but the more consistency and standardization, the better when we bear in mind, as I said, we operate in 180 different countries. We operate as a cruise line, an airline, a hotel and a tour operator. So um, the simpler and the more standardized, the better. So we've got the frameworks on the one hand, um, we're then also listed on a number of ESG rankings and indices. So as part of our disclosures for that, there is a requirement um, to, to provide metrics. So an example would be, uh, for example, uh, so CDP uh, for this year will include, or rather is, is moving to a consolidated report where water, forestry and emissions will be included together. We're currently not on water and forestry, so therefore we will need to start providing more metrics on that um, as part of, of the shift in the indices. So it's just a small example of how if the rankings or indices change their requirements, that also obviously impacts on our metrics. Um, we're publicly listed, so we respond to, uh, or we use, I guess, as a bit of a signal, what's coming from investors and asset management requests in terms of any gaps in our data uh, and make sure that we can cover those. And then last, but in some ways, most importantly, we also have our own TUI Group Sustainability Agenda, which is um, organized around three pillars of people, planet, and progress. No prizes for guests and the environmental metrics sit mostly within the planet pillar, but each of those three areas, people, planet, and progress, have five focus areas. So we have 15 different focus areas and we have a set of metrics um, that go across, uh, sorry, a set of metrics for each of those. So if you boil that down and you say, well, what are we actually uh, collecting when it comes to environmental metrics at the moment? I think um, I've put the main areas up there for you. There will probably be a uh, few, if any, surprises in terms of that. As I mentioned, a big focus on emissions related data, uh, but also water, waste, um, and, and also what happens to that waste in terms of recycling, etc., what I would also uh, highlight, however, is given our global scale uh, and given our um, the complexity of our business, certification, robust, credible uh, third party certification is an extremely useful way for us um, to um, 
to, to understand that, that that area of the business, if I use hotels as an example, is operating um, in, in a more sustainable way and therefore any of the metrics that need to be provided or, supply, or or can be collected as part of the certification process is also extremely helpful so that we are not using very similar but separate uh, and different sets of metrics for, for very similar purposes and equally that we um, that our partners or our own parts of the business are not needing to supply the same data multiple times so um, so I think that's definitely an area where if we if we look at TUI um, as a platform business, as somebody who goes out as well and contracts hundreds of thousands of hotels, if we want to start um, collecting or encouraging our hotel partners to provide this kind of data, then combining it with some form of certification is really important. The second reason why I would highlight that is because one of the one of the key things that we want to do with this data uh, or some of this data is to present it to our customers to enable and then empower them to make more sustainable choices when they're booking their holiday their experiences etc with us so um so in order to present it to customers um then it really obviously needs to go through um some kind of third party verification or assurance process and then um, we're able to have the the confidence um, and the rigor to then show it to customers so at the moment all we are showing and uh, displaying to customers as part of their sales and booking process is is the hotel certified or not um, but our our aim is to move to actually including real data as part of that um in the near future. So just really quickly, um, before I give a bit of a view on the future, very simple in terms of how we're doing it at the moment. Uh, as I say, we use a specialist software system. We have a hierarchy of units uh, users for that. Um, at the moment, it's only a single annual data collection, um, which takes place at the end of our financial year. It's done via, still done via a manual input or bulk upload, even though the kind of the software is online, we don't have any automation um, in terms of the data collection, uh, but we are, um, we do have automated reporting that comes out of the other side. So in terms of where we wanna get to next, um, I mentioned already, uh, we are aware that there are gaps uh, in some of our metrics uh, on areas that are growing in importance, particularly around biodiversity, circular, uh, and also waste management in, this, in the sense of um, an area, for example, like airline, where waste management isn't, um, sorry, the, the, the recycling of the waste is very difficult because of international regulations. Historically, we've not collected as much data on that area as we would, we would like to start doing so in order to drive some of the change we want to see there. But really, it's biodiversity and circular, and this is where we are actively um, working at the moment to understand uh, which metrics we should use, which standardised frameworks are available, um, which have the most applicability, again, across the different areas of our business and geographies. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned, we're only annual at the moment for our core metrics. We want to move to quarterly, and we're in the process of moving to that this financial year, uh, particularly for energy emissions, water and waste. Um, we want to make the, the data collection much smoother. Um, so we're implementing API, smart metering, et cetera, where, where possible. Uh, and more and more, I think the, the last point is probably the most important. We want uh, to get away from just reporting for the sake of reporting. We have to do that. We're publicly listed. We understand um, and embrace our responsibilities there. But the more we can use it to drive change within our business, the more we can use it to change, uh, drive change in consumer behavior. That's where the real value is. Um, but, it, but it all stands or falls on the rigor and reliability of the data. So, um, but as I say, the, the, the more that we can do with it, the better, because um, then, then the change that we all want to see will happen. And that was it. Okay, 10 minutes. 
Thank you, thank you so, so much, Ian, especially for the sticking to the time. I'm really, really uh, want to celebrate that the private sector is also uh, now uh, considering to, to work on indicators on uh, the impact of biodiversity. Really, it's very difficult. I come from that sector. Yes. So I would really want to also as a talk with you on what, uh, how you uh, get to this. Uh, and of course, your part will be available eh, to, to cooperate on, on, on yep, that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask some questions before we open the, the, the debate. So, is there any th threshold below which uh, you wouldn't, uh, including your travel packages or in your services recommendations, uh, if, uh, let's say, the recommendation doesn't comply? With a certain threshold of sustainability, or you just rely on giving this information to the customer and they do their choice? Um, so at the moment, um, it's governed, we have minimum sustainability requirements and standards that are in the contracts. Um, which, so if, if hotels fall below our minimum. Uh, requirements then it would be breach of contract um but absolutely going forward um i can see a situation whereby yes we will you know if we can get to a point of where we have good standardized data and we can understand what consumption levels are like between different types of hotels for example then yes we would definitely be using that as a means to select which hotels do or don't feature in our portfolio. Um, so at, at the moment as well, we are actively promoting um, hotels that are certified. Now for us at the moment, it is just GSTC recognized or accredited hotels, um, but we would like to go further than just use um, the uh, certification because whenever we do research with our customers, they understand the value of certification, but they say, well, what does it mean, right? Can you make it as real or as tangible as possible? So if, if we coalesce around a certain number of key metrics or indicators, customers can start to understand what they are, the comparability of them, and in, incorporate them over time into their buying decisions. But it's that fine line because they're here to buy a holiday and therefore we don't want to overcomplicate it. But definitely we would like to see the ability to move beyond just certification into actual data comparisons, etc. Thank you. So I'm going to pose a question for you, but then I will open it to okay. the others also. Why do you, I have this feeling that it's going to be more expensive accommodations or uh, any other uh, travel, whatever, which are going to be, those that are going to be more sustainable, they're going to be more expensive. Is this just my feeling or do you think this is real and why? So, yeah, it, I mean, it's it's the weird it's the weird thing. It's almost like Graham was mentioning earlier about um, the uh, like the, the the more the the less the less sustainable should be the more expensive, right? But we're all uh, we're all kind of educated that sustainable eco equals luxury, therefore equals premium, therefore equals more expensive. Um, but no, I mean, we've got data that shows that. Um, First of all, we don't charge a premium for it, right? So because uh, it it should just be part and parcel of a of a well run hotel nowadays that they're taking care of this type of things. There's clearly cost savings to be had, particularly um, on energy, um, a little bit on water and waste, but definitely on energy. So no, we we find it's a little bit old now the last research we did was pre-covid but hotels that go through the process of getting certified see a reduction in their operating costs as a consequence of it because they're focusing more on resource efficiency uh, and we also see that their customer satisfaction scores go up because as i say it's just an evident evidence of uh, and part of being a well-run hotel with good quality management standards etc so so no it's it that's like that's a big hurdle because you're absolutely right and our research from consumers tells us the same thing um but but what we want to see is you know two hotels same resort same star rating and facilities one sustainable one's not choose the more sustainable one but it it, it shouldn't come with a with a price premium having said that 
um, and I will just stop now for questions. Um, we do also see evidence um, from research that customers are prepared to pay more, provided you can explain what it is that this hotel has done. And like anything, when it comes to research, there's always the risk of the say do gap where customers will say one thing in research and then do another when it comes to the checkout. But but in, but yes, customers understand the importance. They're interested in the topic. Our job is to make it simple, easy, and comparable in order to it then impact buying decisions. Okay. Would you consider then if these uh, customers were uh, prone to pay more for, for this uh, sustainability to revert some part of this money, like? For regenerative tourism or for uh, payback schemes, uh, would you yeah. facilitate this as a private sector? Yeah. So, well, we already do. We already do in yeah. a sense, right? So, um, so we have uh, the Tui Care Foundation, which is an independent foundation, mm -hmm. and in all of our markets, uh, if a customer books a hotel mm -hmm. that has a sustainability certification, Tui donates one pound or one euro to the Tui Care Foundation. And then they spend that money as they see fit as an independent organization on regenerative tourism, tourism as, as a force for good, et cetera. So, um, but, but yeah, so, uh, and in addition, customers have the option to pay additionally, but in order to support um, this move to booking more sustainable hotels, it, there's a connection between certified hotels and this donation because as as i mentioned we need to make it simple and consistent so at the moment the only the only way we can really do that is by using certification as the as the as the mechanism but over time that could be um supplemented by additional things like if you're booking a hotel that is low or eventually no carbon emissions does that then go to some kind of, you know, um, uh, fund in that area? But at the moment, so we start, we're starting with certification. I'm not saying that that's, that's where it will end by any means. Okay, the final question from, from the chat uh, is that as uh, we group uh, considering to encourage more sustainable uh, ways of traveling in terms of mobility, so uh, to yeah. favor lo local experiences, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so, um, we um so we have a um we have a brand in the uk called first choice which is an online travel agency uh and they have done a partnership uh with byways so byways uh offer basically flight free holidays so it's holidays uh so we're trialing it with them at the moment which is holidays from the uk by train so not the easiest given that it's an island or we're an island um but we want to promote that. We're doing it in a very transparent way. Uh, we are not, uh, we obviously the majority of what we sell is, is uh, by air. So we're not trying to um, overstate it, but we want to offer that where we can. Uh, we also offer uh, ski trains uh, from a number of uh, European countries, including the UK down to um, it, down to the ski resorts so yes it is something that we are looking at i always get a little bit uh nervous because so much of what we do is by air or by ship right so i don't want to pretend um i don't want to mislead anybody we are starting very small but it's an area that we are definitely exploring and looking to grow thank you thank you so much uh for your contribution i'm going to ask now christoph if he has anything to add i've seen that he has already answered the question he was posed on the chat but perhaps he wants to add something and then we will pass the floor to ralph for the concluding uh, remarks christoph, uh, please for uh, thanks no i have nothing to add uh from my side i mean the, the the discussions were interesting and and covering many facets which was quite uh well organized from that point of view so nothing to add from my side. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so much. As, as, as we said in the introduction, we will take care of all the comments uh, and all the questions because uh, this will nurture this uh, process of uh, writing uh, recommendations uh, for the DG Group on, on this uh, topic. My pleasure now to give the floor to Raf Pastlington, if I have pronounced it correctly, who is and the um, chairman of the Green Soup Group and also uh, part of. Please, Ralph, can you uh, take the floor? 
thanks a lot, Teresa, and uh, and everyone who contributed here, Lisa, from uh, from this task force. I think it was a very well organized uh, webinar, and I saw over 350 participants, uh, even from Australia and Africa. So I think uh, you can be very very happy with this uh, webinar. So. Congratulations to everyone who contributed, the speakers, of course, uh, and, uh, and in particular you, Therese and, and Lisa, for pulling this off. Thanks a lot for that. Um, so in terms of a wrap up, of course, it's not easy. Uh, this has been an extremely interesting two hours with many questions, many uh, points that the, 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 the speakers have brought up. Uh, in a nutshell, I would say it's complicated, right? We've seen data. Data is extremely important. It needs to be accurate, accessible, aligned, right? So uh, from that perspective, I think all the speakers mentioned the importance of data as a foundation to actually being able to achieve something in this, uh, in this field. Uh, then we can build reliable and measurable APIs uh, on top of that. And then we can also look at the performance and the execution uh, that needs to be transparently monitored and then ultimately, of course, also enforced. Uh, what we're seeing is a, is a universe of multiple parallel overlapping systems, bodies and standards. Uh, and I, I refer to the last slide of Ioannis there with all the players that are on the certification, but also on the customer side. So I think this is, this is quite interesting and this is uh, a Herculean task uh, in terms of putting all this together. We, we even see entirely different approaches to measuring what and how, and in particular, why, and I refer to the slide of Professor Miller there, uh, uh, why are we measuring what we're measuring, you know? And, and, and some of the systems are almost dead. Uh, it is, and some other systems are not born yet. So how are we going to, to build on what we have already achieved and on all the different um, uh, efforts that are currently ongoing in terms of creating new systems uh, on, on, on top of what we have seen in the past. Um, I was also very, or what made me really think was the uh, comment by, by Professor Miller on sustainable tourism versus actual societal well-being. So are we talking about making tourism sustainable in itself, or are we talking about tourism being a valuable contributor to the well-being of society, right? That really made me think, and I think I'll, I'll take this with me and, and think a little bit more uh, on my own about this, but this is really, really, this left a big impression on me uh, in terms of, you know, does this mean we don't really have the kind of specific indicators for tourism yet? Uh, are we still building, uh, building that house, uh, so to speak? Um, we've seen uh, best practices. Um, thank you, Ian, uh, for that. Uh, and also clearly a willingness to share and cooperate and go beyond reporting for the sake of reporting. So reporting versus clear action. And I think this is this is another step in the wrong, uh, in, uh, sorry, in the right direction. Uh, we report, and this is extremely important, but we also need to, to, to focus on action. Uh, and of course, we need the right environment uh, also from a regulatory perspective to encourage that. Um, a question that came up for me during all this is of course, how will we ensure access to complex indicator systems for smaller tourism players? We're not all large. There are small and medium-sized tourism players. They also need, um, they need easy access to these, to these systems. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, we need to, to consider the entire uh, tourism ecosystem and landscape in this regard. Collaboration and safe data sharing, I think, is, is another element that I came up with. Following this discussion, we need to look at compliance. We need to, to look at the, the collaboration of all the players. Uh, again, uh, the slide we've seen there at, at the end of Johannes' uh, presentation, but it needs to be safe. We need to share the data in a way that everyone feels, feels comfortable about it. But again, we need to drill down to what data is really important to get to the, um, to the point where we can make it use, useful in, in setting up a, a new, ideally EU-wide system. Consumer benefit, clear and easy to manage for companies, yes, but also clear and easy to understand and apply for the customer. Again, what is the benefit for the customer? Is there a societal benefit? Is there a personal benefit in these systems? How can uh, the customer get the most out of them uh, in terms of uh, you know, going on a holiday, but also understanding the footprint 
of the holiday that he is enjoying at this moment. Uh, last but not least, I think what we're all trying to do here is engaging stakeholders. This is what, why we're really here. And this is also, I think, very much uh, a core uh, element behind this debate today. We would like to revive the debate and contribute uh, to a more meaningful outcome uh, with all of you going forwards in this particular field. So let's not forget that this event is a milestone. It's not the, the end of the journey. You know, it's, it's a milestone on this journey of getting things done in terms of uh, the, the, the right way forward for, uh, for the indicators in the, um, in the tourism sector. And I think we should all aim to get it done before Professor Miller retires. I think we have this joint goal. We should really get things done. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone, for your very, very valuable contributions. Every, every speaker, I think, has, has shown a very specific element of the bigger picture. And I think it's now up to all of us here in this, in this call and beyond to pick up these takeaways, run with them, continue the discussion together, and get things done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph, for your uh, wise words. Uh, it has been a very long webinar, two hours. Sorry for the technical problems at the very beginning. Uh, and I would just ask to everyone before leaving, if you could um, fill in a one minute survey that my, my colleague Anna um, Castigliani, Castigliani has been uh, in the backstage uh, helping me with the webinar organization. So she will put a, a link to this survey. And um, again, I just say, Thank you to everyone for staying the whole webinar and uh, have a nice week. <laughs>